probably come to the size of the steel cameras here. We'll be uh, streaming as soon as they uh, so be going out over the air. So we'll have to keep our uh, conversation to a minimum. Sure. Yeah, 
In 2009, Kate Stoneman was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls. The Kate Stoneman program is an important part of our Albany Law School tradition. It allows us to celebrate the contributions of those who advance women in the legal profession. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the event. Tonight, four women will join our prestigious circle of Kate Stoneman Award recipients, bringing to 71 the total number of extraordinary individuals honored since the program started in 1994. At this time, I would like past honorees to please stand. We can recognize them. You all continue to inspire us. I would like to acknowledge all of those who helped make today a reality, including President Penny Andrews, members of the Kate Stoneman Day Committee, and of course my co-chairs, Professor Pam Armstrong, and Director of Alumni Affairs and Special Events, Ken Wayne. I would like to also especially thank the support of Jessica Wagner and the Women's Law Caucus for helping us today. I also want to thank Professor Rogerson and Tammy Wyman for hosting an earlier celebration of the 20th anniversary last spring. Be sure to note the beautiful banner of that they had uh, prepared. And it's just been a wonderful year of celebrations. This just continues from their good work. So thank you all. Before I introduce uh, President Penny Andrews, I want to acknowledge that she herself was Albany Law School's Kate Stoneman Visiting Professor in Law and Democracy in the spring of 2002 and was honored with the Kate Stoneman Award in that year. She's also been Albany Law School's first full female president and dean, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome her to the podium. I'd like to welcome everyone here. I know that we have many friends of Albany Law School here. We have members of the judiciary. We have uh, Ms. Katz, who's been a very strong supporter of the Stoneman. I want to honor the Stoneman Committee. Tammy Weinman has done a wonderful job keeping this uh, uh, program, organizing this program. And there are many, many friends, uh, alumni, students, members of the community. So I'll say welcome and all protocol observed. Um, for me, it's a very special honor to introduce the 2014 Kate Stoneman speaker, the Honorable Judge Navi Pillay. Uh, she and I both graduated from the same university, the University of Natal. Um, she, after she graduated from uh, uh, the University of Natal, uh, she obtained an LLM from Harvard Law School in 1982, and as well as the SJD. Now, I first got to know Judge Pillay when I was an undergraduate student <coughs> at the University of Natal in Durban in the late 1970s, 1977 to be exact. Um, I was then the coordinator of the Legal Aid Clinic, and my job was to run the clinic and ensure that we had sufficient numbers of volunteer lawyers to work at the clinic over weekends in downtown Durban. Now the late 1970s was a very difficult time in South Africa and there were very few lawyers like Judge Navi Pillay who were prepared to do what they do, not just serve poor people, but really face the um, uh, security establishment. She has. Uh, being persecuted by the, secure, by the South African authorities. She was a really, really a valiant anti-apartheid activist. Uh, she was the first non-white woman to open her own law pr uh, practice in Natal. Um, in an interview, she was asked, and she said about opening her practice, she said that she had no other alternative no law, firm, no law firm would employ me, she said, because they said they could not have white employees taking instructions from a colored person. During her 28 years as a lawyer in South Africa, she defended anti-apartheid activists, as I said, and she has done extraordinary things to reach, to get to the point uh, where South Africa did in 1994. Um, before 1994, she co-founded the advice desk for the abused 
and she ran a shelter for victims of domestic violence in Durban and beyond. She was very, very significant in the National Women's Coalition, which was the women's coalition that ensured that South Africa's constitution did not just focus on race and other forms of discrimination, but really centered gender discrimination, sex discrimination, sexual orient discri orientation discrimination, and so on. So that was a very, very important part of South Africa's constitutional evolution. Um, she also, very early during the constitutional negotiations, she co-founded uh, the international women's rights group Equality Now, which is one of the most prominent international women's human rights organizations. Uh, one year after democracy came to South Africa in 1995, President Mandela nominated Navi Pillay as the first non-white woman in South African parlance to serve on the High Court of South Africa. Okay. But her tenure was very short because she was very soon uh, after that uh, uh, elected by the United Nations General Assembly to serve as the judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And it was at that tri on that tribunal where she served for eight years, including four years as president, where you can find the answer to the question that is always asked, will a woman judge make a difference? I say resoundingly yes, because Judge Navi Pillay essentially was the first judge in the Akaisu decision to establish that rape and sexual uh, assault could constitute acts of genocide. And that was an In February 2003, she was elected to the first panel of judges of the International Criminal Court, and she was assigned to the Appeals Division. Uh, she was elected to a six-year term, but again, that was cut short because she was asked to take up a, a, her position as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. In that position, uh, Judge uh, Pele has really given international law, those of us who are international law scholars and those of us who still uh, dare to believe that the United Nations and international law can make a difference, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Israel slash Palestine, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's North Korea, whether it's the United States or Canada, Judge Pillay has really made a mark and to ensure that the notion of human rights and the idea of human rights is alive and well. South Africa always talks about heroes like Nelson Mandela and so on, but Navi Pillay is truly one of South Africa's great heroes and I am very, very pleased to introduce her. The trouble with inviting somebody as old as me is you have to go for a long CD. <laughs> um, I've just retired having this tremendous job of watching out for the promotion and protection of human rights, all human rights, all persons all over the world. And yesterday I met my successor, Zayed uh, Hussein from Jordan, and he said, how did you do it? It's already <laughs> too much work. <laughs> um, but uh, Penny has asked me to address you on some aspect of, of uh, gender, gender equality, and that is what I'm going to be doing today. I'm hoping rather to address the international aspect, but before I do that, let me point out sometime in the United States that unlike most other countries in the world, the USA does not have a constitutional equality provision guaranteeing equal rights for women. And the US Supreme Court Judge Antonin Scalia has observed that, quote him, certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it, it does not. 
And of course, I have also have a quote from Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said, every constitution written since the end of World War II includes a provision that men and women are citizens of equal stature. Ours does not. I have three granddaughters, she said. I'd like them to be able to take out their constitution and say, here is a basic premise of our system that men and women are persons of equal stature. But it's not in there. We just have the Equal Protection Clause, which everyone knows was not meant in the 1860s to change anything with regard to women's status. Women didn't get to vote until 1920. So, since I'm here in Rome, why not speak about this situation? <laughs> um, I've recently had an opportunity to look at a book that is going to be uh, launched. It's by Jessica Newark, who is the co-founder founder of Equality now with me. And she's trying to um, draw attention to the Equal Rights Amendment as well. Uh, so, although the 14th Amendment promised equal protection under the law, when American women finally won the right to vote in 1920, the Equal Rights Amendment Bill failed to pass as five of the 38 states withheld support and was blocked by right-wing economic and religious lobbies. I think they're still around. <laughs> the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868 to address racial discrimination by prohibiting states from denying any person the equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court applies the highest standard of strict scrutiny to racial or religious discrimination uh, necessary to achieve uh, a compelling governmental interest to the aspect of religious and racial discrimination, but for sex discrimination, the test is whether the laws under challenge bears a substantial relationship to an important governmental interest, or a much lower standard. Now, many explicitly discriminatory laws have been changed in the United States, yet gender discrimination and inequality persists in areas such as employment, salaries, and lack of protection against violence. Around the world, of course, women suffer great inequalities and hardship and are most vulnerable to the worst effects of violence, including sexual violence, poverty, environmental degradation, conflicts, displacement, and other human rights violations. Now to international law, the framework with which I've worked under for the last six years. International law sets very clear standards of equality and freedom from discrimination and human dignity for all persons. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the foundational document for equality and respect for human rights. And then together with many other treaties and conventions, that flesh out the various rights, civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. This forms the bedrock of our international system of norms, values, and principles. And most constitutions and national legal systems of states embody those principles. The United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, is clearly the most comprehensive framework against discrimination against women and is considered as the International Bill of Rights for Women. It has been signed and ratified by 187 countries except the United States with Iran, Somalia, South Sudan, South Pacific Islands of Palo and Tonga as their veterans. CEDAW prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. And as a treaty under the Supremacy Clause of the US Constitution, it would be considered law in the USA. So in, in talking about a revival of the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, Jessica Newark writes, we, can, we cannot hope for our country to be a true global leader on women's rights when we lack legal recognition of women's equality rights, not only in our international legal 
commitments, but even in our own constitution. And of course, she reviews a, a, a huge number of cases before the Supreme Court where clearly uh, women who were disadvantaged uh, received uh, no remedy. Many women have sought remedies against sex discrimination in employment. Women here still earn 77 cents on average for every dollar earned by men. But the courts have apparently upheld the constitutionality of paying a woman less than a man for similar work. Victims of gender-based violence have sought uh, justice from the Constitution basing their claims on the Equal Protection Clause, the Commerce Clause, and the Due Process Clause of the 13th Amendment. All were denied by the Supreme Court on the premise that remedies for violence against women had no place in federal jurisdiction. So in other words, it's the public right that is protected and not an individual's right. Now, you will recall that in the 90s, as a result of international pressure from civil societies all over the world, very many countries, including my own, adopted national legislation against domestic violence. Uh, and similarly, in the United States, there was um, a, a law adopted called Violence Against Women Laws. In 1994, Congress passed such a law which was championed by Joe Biden, after finding that bias in state criminal justice systems often resulted in victims of gender-based violence not receiving the benefits of equal protection of the laws. Uh, however, this law was struck down by the, uh, the Constitutional Court because they said that Congress lacked the power to create a private right of action for victims of violence against women. So that being the national situation, let me say that uh, in 1990, when President Mandela, when well, he wasn't president then, emerged from prison, and we had that hiatus period to, to think about what kind of democracy we wanted. It was the women who got together first, and Penny Andrews referred to it, the Women's National Coalition. Uh, I myself uh, was a lawyer in Natal, and I simply did not want to be sitting around the table talking to a whole lot of women with whom I disagreed. Amongst them were Afrikaans women who, who did not want the law on the minority status of women to be changed because they said they didn't want to hurt their husbands. And yet I was a fully-fledged lawyer, but I was still a minor under the law, and I needed my husband's consent to sign contracts, and he opened the bank account and owned the bank account. I earned the money. So really, um, <laughs> so you see what I mean? We were, were totally suspicious of, of the diverse opinions. I didn't want to engage. I was pushed in there by women <laughs> in my province. Said, you have to go there, otherwise our province will not be represented. And the first shock for me is how much Women hated lawyers. <laughs> so I was in the lawyers group. We thought we were going to write this charter out. And we debated a lot about equity and equality uh, until someone ordered us to draw a, a, a questionnaire. And that went round to, to the street, to supermarkets, and so on. And to my surprise, what women wanted is a right to education for their children, equal salary, housing. See, civil and political rights, but also social economic rights. And as we grappled with this, of course, we left off contentious <coughs> issues such as abortion and polygamous marriages because there was a large group of women there who supported uh, their husbands having many wives. And they felt sorry for us, stuck with one husband. <laughs> so, so you knew to keep away from contentious issues. And we didn't know this document that we were drawing is going to be taken seriously, what the status of it will be. But there were very many A and C women in this group. And so that entire document became our Bill of Rights. So that's a contribution of women. We have the equality principle. 
Um, we have the right to sexual orientation in our constitution. South Africa is under a huge attack by other African states, I should uh, tell you, for betraying Africa by joining with the United States on championing the right of uh, LGBTI community. But it's in our constitution, so we respect that. And very early on, the Constitutional Court declared the death penalty as unconstitutional. We have 11 judges giving separate opinions. We're very proud of that. Um, but, and then, of course, a wonderful Constitutional Court that uh, gave us our rights by interpreting that Constitution. For instance, the right to housing. South Africa has not ratified the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, nor has the United States for that matter. But the Constitution allowed the judges the flexibility to refer to international law where the law was not sufficiently clear on the matter. So even though we are not a party to the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Constitutional Court introduced those principles in and allowed the right to housing, as they did the right to antiretroviral medication for the treatment of HIV AIDS, which the uh, then President of South Africa was stopping, uh, Mr. Mbeki, as you know. So these are all very good decisions. The one that I particularly like was delivered by Judge Albie Sachs, and his was with regard to domestic violence that the state has an obligation to protect women against domestic violence. Uh, now, we could do all that because we have the equality clause in our constitution. Our constitution embodies all the uh, principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we also have the right to dignity, which you don't have in your constitution. And you'll be amazed how judges are able to flesh out the right to dignity, to look after the human rights of very many people who suffer violations. Now, what do we have in international law apart from the UDHR? We have the CEDAW that I've mentioned, and you have the Rome Statute uh, establishing the International Criminal Court. I hope one day that big states such as the United States, Russia, China, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and, and other Middle Eastern countries will become parties to the International Criminal Court because it supports a very important principle of no impunity for serious crimes, for serious crimes, and requiring accountability. And it's so relevant in today's age when there are raging conflicts all over, where commissions of inquiry set up by the Human Rights Council and mainly uh, chaired by judges. As long as I was High Commissioner, I made sure that judges uh, come to sit on those commissions because if these are fact-finding commissions and not judicial investigations. But we need the authority, the impartiality uh, of, of a judge. For that one, one lobby criticized me for bringing in all my cronies into this commission. <laughs> um, so it's these... Uh, Commissions of inquiry always recommend the principle of accountability, that these very serious crimes should not go unpunished. Um, so, Rome Statute protects individual rights in this respect. It introduces four new crimes, which are not there in national jurisdictions. They include uh, crimes such as sexual slavery, forced pregnancy, uh, and you'll find, actually, these crimes are very relevant in the national section. You know of those, one Austrian, one Austrian and one uh, in the United States, of uh, women being abducted and held, kept as sex slaves in, in homes for a very long time. And I noticed that the charge in the national jurisdiction was rape, both in Austria and here. Um, because we don't have the crime of sexual slavery in our statute. So the Rome Statute has got that, those good examples, and it spells out the rights of victims, both to participate in the proceedings, 
and to, to have the right to reparation. Now these two new areas are what I had to cover when I sat with four other judges on the appeals chamber, and it did come on appeal before us. It was, it's very new to me. We, we follow the common law system just like you. And it's very new to me to have victims participating in court proceedings. But that's the principles laid down in the Rome Statute, and we spelt out to them that they have the right to participate, they, have, they can cross-examine, they can um, ask for discovery, disclosure of documents, but we said it's for the judges to control the proceedings. Um, so I, I mentioned these uh, important elements out there. Let me say that we have, apart from the International Criminal Court, which provides international criminal justice and accountability that we've never had since Nuremberg, so almost a 60-year gap, it's a tremendous achievement that this has been done in the last 20 years. There are other UN mechanisms addressing uh, the gender disparities, that's UN Women, UNFPA, which is a population fund. Both these organizations, in very recent conferences last year, received huge pushbacks from certain member states uh, who wanted a pushback on, on women's rights, particularly on reproductive rights. The Human Rights Council, which I serviced in Geneva, has a, a mechanism called the Universal Periodic Review. All 192 states voluntarily submitted themselves to peer review of their human rights record. Other states make recommendations to the states concerned. It's called the UPR. And you may well like to see the almost 300 recommendations made to the United States. But it's, it's about the same number to other states as well. So there isn't a state in the world that can claim a perfect record, even, even the Scandinavian countries. <laughs> And as high, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights supports all these various institutions, including national human rights institutions and public protectors office, and so on. So I do have to conclude now. I thought I'll give you a very uh, small picture of uh, that the U.S. is definitely a, a leader in supporting human rights. <coughs> they were of huge uh, benefit to me in taking up various issues. But if you want to be claiming the moral authority to tell other states how they should conduct their affairs, particularly in respect of human rights, then you have to be that model and provide protection. Yes, so I would say it's high time that CEDA was ratified by the United States, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, and I would also say it's time to amend the Constitution and provide an equal rights protection clause. And I'm very happy that there's so many uh, young people here. There's so many ways in which you can take things forward. You obviously do not suffer the discrimination that my generation did. Um, so you have a super advantage to come up with new ideas, new initiatives. I was once told by someone to uh, hire just under 25-year-olds mm -hmm. in my office because that's a new generation, the uh, internet and, and social media generation with, with great ideas. But I, as a final note, let me say that um, within a week of retiring, I was with a, a group of academics who were addressing the question of parity on the bench for women, and there were a number of... Uh, judges, from, mainly from Europe, constitutional court judges, and so on. Uh, and, you know, and I thought it's, it's such a simple statement to say we want parity. But it's the academics who ask the question on why. And as we try to spell it out, should we have a quota or not? Uh, do women come with particular qualities? What about merit and, and, and the judicial professional qualifications? I truly appreciate discussions with academics and students because they really get you to think about these matters. What I said there is that the question should be why are women being excluded? That should be the question. For 60 years, 
uh, women were excluded from the higher level positions in the United States. But this Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has appointed women in 13 USG positions where previously for 60 years they were all occupied by men. So where were the others looking? Are women invisible? So I wouldn't call it quota or anything else, but that qualified people are there. Don't exclude them. So thank you. and expanding opportunities for women. was taken up at the board meeting. <laughs> so, um, uh, but she was, I heard, to pay. Um, she was an aggressive and an idealistic young attorney. She represented low-income people in need. And um, when she was asked why and what legal aid was all about, she said that our purpose was not only to hand out, but also to hand over. She said that legal aid seeks to restore not only the material values that have been rightfully earned and wrongfully withheld, but also to rehabilitate through the rekindling of their faith in justice and in all of the American institutions of justice. So I, I have to say, right, she was right on. Yeah. Um, one short story. Uh, I was told that she represented a sailor, many sailors, who were then a working port right here in Albany, and he had not been paid by the captain of his ship. So the history at Legal Aid says Ruth Miner got in a boat, rode out to the ship, and demanded her client's wages. And later on, she was asked why she would take a case involving as little as $1. And uh, she said, I was told, 
he said, because, my dear, justice is not about money. Justice is an idea. And this very principle has inspired generations of legal aid lawyers ever since. She also proved herself to be a pragmatic and thoughtful leader for legal aid. She, she was on our board. I have read some of those early annual reports. And although I like to think that I invented the need to really tell the story of our clients' lives, it seems that Ruth Minor actually did. <laughs> and, um, so she would not only say, oh, we represented, and she did in that first year, represent 93 low-income people here in Albany. She also knew she had to talk about the woman who was left destitute by her husband, sole care and provider for the children in her household. And she tried to bring the stories of our clients' lives to life for, I think it was called the Community Chest, the predecessor to our United Way. So I follow in great footsteps. <coughs> she, again, she participated in our national legal aid organization um, and then went on to enjoy great success in private practice and government service. She continued, and she, and she didn't die until 1980, okay? She continued to contribute all her life to her church, to our community, and to the Legal Aid Society, serving on our board of directors and giving of her idealism and her spirit for public good. So it's a wonderful privilege to have had Ruth Minor as my first predecessor. I join the generations of legal aid lawyers in standing on Ruth Minor's shoulders. We at the Legal Aid Society remember Ruth Minor every several years by giving an award named in her honor, the Ruth Minor Award, to a woman who has been of outstanding service to the Legal Aid Society. So again, thank you to the Albany Law School for recognizing this very direct link from Kate Stoneman to Ruth Minor and from Ruth Minor to all legal aid lawyers today. Um, we are all inspired by Ruth Miner's passion, by her principles, by her pragmatism, and I think of her as a very powerful woman as well. And uh, I hope you will too. Um, I just wanted to take a moment, and I think there are a couple of legal aid lawyers in the room, and I just wanted to ask you if you would join me in recognizing that. sent out its newsletter about tonight's event, the group added the following, which I'd like to share with you. As a founding member, member of the Women's Bar Association of the State of New York and the organization's second president, Marge Carroll traveled the state encouraging women attorneys to form chapters and participate to promote Wabazni's various goals and objectives. During her presidency, she almost single-handedly tripled the size of the fledgling statewide organization, growing it from five to 15 chapters. In addition, Marge Carroll worked tirelessly to promote, to promote Wabazni's legislative agenda, establishing its credibility within state government, and giving it the important voice that it now has on issues relevant to women. After serving as the president of Wabazni, she turned her attention to the Capital District Women's Bar Association, serving on that organization's board of directors from 1985 to 1991. During this time, Marge served as a mentor and a role model to young women attorneys, including many graduates of Albany Law School, her alma mater. She published articles, she gave numerous talks on gender discrimination, while supporting young women attorneys as they sought to advance in the profession. Many of the women she mentored went on to have successful and distinguished careers as partners in law firms, judges, professors. 
She's now a sustaining member of the organization. We are so proud of her. Now, my co-chair, my Stoneman co-chair, Professor Pam Armstrong, was hoping to introduce um, Marge, and she unfortunately could not be here today. She has her own special story of how it's because of Marge that she has her career and her husband. Um, but I am, it's my pleasure to invite Thea Hoth, Albany Law Class of 1976, and past president of the Capital District Women, Women's Bar Association, to read Pam's beautiful remarks and add some of her own. Thank you so much for standing in last minute. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, undertake this very, very pleasant duty. <clears throat> These are uh, Pam Armstrong's uh, remarks, somewhat redacted to avoid repetition. Uh, Marjorie Crow has been a role model in all of the capacities, leader, mentor, family person, lawyer, scholar, advocate, and partner. Um, and she's done all of this at the same time. A member of the Albany Law Review and of the Justinian Society, Marge graduated from Albany Law School, cum laude, of course, in 1974. She was what we now call a non-traditional student, not because she was female, is female, though that would have been enough in 1974 where there were, when there were uh, precious few women in law schools, but because she attended law school while parenting. And she wasn't just parenting a child. She was parenting six. In fact, um, those lucky kids um, often were driven hither, thither, and yon in the same vehicle that Marge sometimes drove to the law school, the uh, psychedelic painted uh, VW bus. Because <laughs> it was the 70s. <laughs> Her first law-related job was as the only woman in one of all these premier law firms where, equally non-traditionally, she entered the legal fields she would practice for most of her career, labor and employment law and employee benefits. These practice areas provided just one opportunity to advance the interests of women. As someone who has been devoted to and has integrated all facets of her life, Marge actively sought change and opportunities for women in the legal profession in each aspect of her life. And Melissa has already read the statement uh, made by the Women's Bar Association of, of Marge's prodigious efforts um, in uh, participating in the Women's Bar Association and uh, really creating it as a statewide entity and a statewide entity of significance <coughs> in New York State. <clears throat> her dedication to the profession and advancement of women in the profession is also seen in her appointment to numerous committees and commissions, including the New York State Task Force on Women in the Courts, as the first female general counsel to the state's 22,000 member Civil Service Employees Association, where she hired several female lawyers to staff the counsel's office. As an attorney, she advocated for granting maternity leaves without loss of benefits and for pay parity. Margie didn't accomplish that one. <laughs> <laughs> As a scholar, she has written on marital rights for women and on women and the law. She has spoken on discrimination against women. As a mentor, she has supported women in their quest for judgeships, law firm partnerships, and other advancements. And I, uh, I hope I don't presume to say that some of the people, some of the judges in the audience today are judges because of Marge Perot's um, efforts, uh, mentoring, support over the years. Now remember, these are uh, Pamela and uh, Armstrong's uh, comments. There are many of us today who owe some part of our success in this profession to Marge, whether we are someone who was, was taken under Marge's wing and later became a judge, maybe someone who met Marge at a women's bar association, statewide or local meeting, and was inspired or mentored or someone who was fortunate to count her as a warm and caring friend, 
or in the case of one of the faculty here, I think we're to read Professor Armstrong, <laughs> someone who met both her career and her partner because Marge hired and mentored her. I would now like to very selfishly add some comments of my own, if I may. What I think is so remarkable about Marge, in addition to all of the above, which of course is plenty, is um, that the zeal, the insight to identify problems, to strategize solutions, to see a better outcome that have imbued her professional career and her efforts on behalf of women in the profession are qualities that imbue all aspects of her life. And I'd like to give you just a couple of examples, and they're not legal, but this just shows you. In Marge's retirement, because she has nothing else to do, um, a few years ago, some of you may know from either a direct um, observation or from reading the papers, the city of Schenectady School District was in disarray. Uh, the school board was upon the superintendent. The superintendent, just for, uh, just for diplomacy purposes, uh, let's say, had to go. And there was a lot of hand drinking in Schenectady and a lot of, oh, woe is us in Schenectady. And Marge sat down one day and she wrote a letter to the editor of the Schenectady Gazette and said, listen, we all know we need new blood on the school board in Schenectady. Somebody's got to start the ball rolling here. I invite anyone who is interested in this topic, as I am, my children were all educated in the city of Schenectady schools. Please come to my home. Please contact me. Come to my home, and we will meet. Well, that's what she did. She <laughs> put this invitation out there. People called her. People came to her home. They formed a committee. They shook the bushes. They talked to community groups. They developed a roster of candidates who were interested truly in the children of the city of Schenectady. They forwarded those candidates, they promoted those candidates, and, and they changed the makeup of the board of the city of, school, city of Schenectady School District. Marge did that, um, as far as I'm concerned. Here's another thing she's doing in her retirement, in between um, many other things. Uh, she is now trying valiantly to um, start, kickstart, a preschool reading program for little kids, preschoolers, in the inner city areas of Schenectady. And this is only one of her current um, passionate activities. And um, I invite anyone here who would be interested in helping out in that to, have, to give Marge a phone call because she, uh, not that she would be shy to ask of it, but I, you know, put it out to anybody here who might want to do that. So I just think that those are two examples of how she has vision and tenacity, and she has always championed um, the the um, sometimes the unpopular and championed the underdog. And on top of all of that, to say she is a mentor and a friend is such an understatement. She has been both to me, and I know she has been that to many people in this room. It is with um, great, great pleasure that I ask Marge to come to the podium, please. Award was named Kate Stoneman. My friend Judge Sheehan, those of you who remember Betsy, and I argued all through law school as to which one of us was the oldest living law student. 
But in reading Kate Stoneman's story, I realized that the honor is hers. She graduated from Albany Law School in 1898 when she was 57 years old. I was only 45. <laughs> so I can't help thinking how she must have felt when after passing the bar exam, the first woman in the state to do so, she was turned back <coughs> by three judges for three reasons. Number one, no precedent. Number two, no English precedent. And number three, and the worst one, no necessity. And after these pronouncements, Stoneman successfully lobbied to change the code of civil procedure in order to allow for the admission of all qualified applicants, regardless of race or gender. Now, I came late to law, 20 years after graduating from Smith College, six years after the birth of my sixth child, and approximately 45 minutes after I learned that this Connected East School System had a lunch program and I could send my kids there. <laughs> so in my graduating class of 1974, there were 30 women, an all-time high. In the preceding classes, there were like five, uh, maybe 15, five, three, and one. I have no idea how many women attended or graduated from Albany Law School between Kate Stoneman and the next 72 years, but I'm willing to bet they could probably be counted on 10 fingers. Going to law school at an advanced age was one of the most frightening, exhilarating, and satisfying decisions in my life. I love the law, and I love the lawyers. And that probably is not a statement that you hear consistently <laughs> said aloud. But I do. They are quarrelsome, interesting, bright, dedicated, assertive, witty, and very good company. And many of the people I love most in this world are my lawyer friends, and it is because of those friends that I am here today. During my legal career, there are two things of which I am inordinately proud. The first is my great good fortune in being one of the founding mothers of the Women's Bar Association of the State of New York. It was founded in 1980, and I am so sorry that Sandy Miller couldn't be here today because she was. The, it was at her house that I was nominated to be the second president. I can remember coming down the throughway in a blizzard, in a VW bug that had no snow tires. I must have gone no more than 12 miles an hour. And when I arrived at the house in Westchester, it's just one of the most wonderful days of my life. During the time, uh, so I was president of the association from 1982 to 1994, and during that time we took the original five chapters to 15, and they went all across the state. We are now 18 chapters and almost 4,000 members strong. We are the largest statewide bar association de dedicated to promoting the advancement of women in the legal profession and our mission commits us to improving the status of all women. The second thing I am so proud of is the publication in 1986 of Through the Graces of Chief Judge Lawrence Cook of the report of the New York Task Force on Women in the Courts. It was published in the Fordham Law Urban Law Journal, Volume 1, 1986-87. I believe that this was a first in New York, the first time that the relationship of women to the courts as litigants, as lawyers, as judges, as employees had been thoroughly documented. It was studied over a period of 22 months. The task force amassed data, personal, statistical, analytical, observational and anecdotal, and came to the indisputable conclusion that gender bias permeated each and every layer of the court interaction with the public it served. 
It was an honor to serve on that task force, and now, 28 years later, while not all of the recommendations put forth have been adopted, I believe that that report did serve as a strong catalyst to improve the quality of women in the interactions with the court. I love the law. I thought then, as I think now, that our court system offers a better way to resolve disputes than violence. It is the only justification for the money that we spend on them. But the courts work only when the citizens believe that they are objective and fair and available. To be objective, courts must understand all points of view, and that can only happen when those persons who have an impact on court decisions are diverse. To be fair, the courts must set aside prejudice, which means that they must first recognize that our culture can be prejudiced and that they, as a reflection of that culture, may also be biased. To be available, the courts must provide access to the system. That means that they must make it not just possible, but probable, that persons who have not been a part of the traditional constituency can use the system. I think that we all, as lawyers, have an obligation to make that happen. I have worked all my personal and professional life for fairness, and for long as there is left, I will continue to do so. So that, unlike Kate Stoltman, no person whatsoever who has met all the qualifications need ever hear the words of exclusion again. No precedent, no necessity. I am so honored to receive this award. I'm honored to be in this company. I thank all of you here. I thank Albany Law School for bestowing this award on me, and I thank all of you here who have come to spend this happy day. Keynote speaker in 1994, 
former Court of Appeals Chief Justice Judith Kaye. Judge Kaye also wishes she could be here today. She has authorized me to read her wonderful support letter as well. To the Kate Stoneman Award Committee, I am so pleased to join in the nomination of Judge Sandra Miller for the coveted Kate Stoneman Award. Though our friendship goes back three decades, and I have admired her ceaseless quest for justice, especially for families, throughout, she really captivated my heart this year. Her anniversary as a member of Harvard Law School's first graduating class of women. Imagine what it took to achieve that feat. In all the years since, she has labored tirelessly as a lawyer, judge, and now again as a lawyer, to achieve reforms that would help and enable women within the profession and within society. Choosing Judge Miller would make Kate Stoneman and all of us proud. Sincerely, Judith Kay. So let's join in a round of applause for some of you. And finally, try to keep it together for this one. Um, <laughs> it is a true pleasure to present a very special Kate Stoneman recognition to my dear friend and colleague, Professor Mary Lynch. It is fitting that 2014 is also the 20th anniversary of our domestic violence clinics here at Albany Law School, where Professor Lynch has served with distinction as the head of two of our domestic violence clinics, as well as the director of all of our clinics. She has dedicated her career to women's issues on a number of levels, and she so richly deserves this recognition. I will read briefly from a letter of nomination signed by myself, Justice Grappio, Judge Carter, a whole list of distinguished, uh, distinguished guests, and 22 faculty members. So she is beloved here. From that letter I read, we believe that Mary personifies and embodies Kate Stoneman on so many levels. The letter then goes on to state all of those reasons. But then here is our double caveat. For two reasons, writing a letter on behalf of someone as extraordinary as Mary is challenging. First, any letter outlining her amazing accomplishments would appear to be hyperbole, even though it's true. Second, Mary has contributed to the law school and to the larger community in so many ways, it is nearly impossible to recount them in one letter. I also want to read, read briefly from a letter of support from Lisa Frisch, the executive director of the legal project. Without Mary as a community partner throughout these years, no doubt we would not have achieved the level of progressive change in how we respond to violence against women in this region and beyond. She then goes on to add, Mary clearly personifies the meaning of the award and the memory of Kate Stoneman. I am now honored to introduce Judge Rosado, Ian Rosado, to present the special Stoneman recognition to Mary Lynch. <coughs> Hello everyone, I'll try to keep this short. I am Yannette, I am Judge Yannette Rosado, class of 1997 of Albany Law School. I would first like to congratulate all the honorees tonight. The pioneering spirit of women is clearly evident here today, thereby keeping alive the Kate Stoneman spirit. Secondly, I would like to thank Professor Melissa Breger for sharing the podium with me in order for me to say a few words on behalf of my family and all of the students that Mary has touched. I would like to give a special shout out to Professor Melissa Breger, Lisa Frisch, and all the individuals that made this day possible in order for us to recognize Professor Mary Lynch. I'm gonna try not to be emotional, Mary, but okay, you know that I am. On. I touch it. <laughs> I first met Mary Lynch as her student in the post-conviction remedies clinic. While at the clinic, under her supervision, I was able to work on the Charlene Brundage case. It was in that capacity that I was able to observe Professor Lynch. She was a zealous advocate for Charlene, and she demanded the same from us. She constantly encouraged us to do our best. No stone was left unturned in our fight for Charlene's Liberty. We traveled to New York City. We obtained records. We tracked down witnesses. We interviewed witnesses. We spoke to advocates of domestic violence victims. We read, reread, wrote, rewrote all of the papers that we submitted to the court. Mary was relentless. She wanted to make sure that we gave 100% of ourselves 
every day, every hour, every minute, and every second that we worked on that case. I will never forget where I was or how I felt when I got the call that the governor had granted Charlene's clemency. It was truly an exhilarating and transforming moment for me, one that sealed my fate and affirmed my destiny of serving the public with my law school degree. Professor Lynch made the law come alive to me. She helped me develop a passion for justice, allowing me to exercise great professional judgment. Professor Lynch planted a seed I was able to cultivate, allowing me to learn and practice different areas of laws in different courts. I have practiced everything from labor law, products liability, commercial litigation, <laughs> personal injury, criminal law, as well as civil law. I was able to practice in lower civil, lower criminal, criminal supreme, civil supreme, and appellate term, first department, appellate division. I have been able to see domestic violence through the eyes of the batterer, the eyes of the victim, and the eyes of the child involved in that family. In my capacity as a legal aid attorney for the criminal defense division, as a court attorney to several judges, and as an attorney for children at the Children's Law Center, these experiences, which Mary helped trigger, launch, ricochet, <laughs> have helped me to be a better person and do a better job in my current position. As an elected civil court judge, sitting in family court in Bronx County, presiding over custody, visitation, family offenses, and guardianship cases. I want to share a personal note with you. In January, I made two years as a judge on the bench. Is not an easy task, particularly when you're dealing with children. Just last Friday, I was approached by the president of the Family Court Bar Association. He informed me that I was nominated to be honored at their annual, at their annual dinner. As many of you know, this honor is usually bestowed on judges senior to me. I was humbled and taken aback by the gesture. He proceeded to tell me that the vote to nominate me was unanimous and that the attorneys all kept saying the same thing. In her application of the law, she is changing lives. Changing lives, wow. The first thought was Albany Law School. I was walking in the footsteps of great women before me. The first of that woman is our very own first lady, Kay Stoneman. The second, Professor Mary Lynch. It made me think about all the women in my life, whether through history books or in my life, that broke barriers, opened doors, and changed lives. It is for this reason that I rearranged my entire schedule this week. <laughs> Not an easy feat for a family court judge with 984 cases. It is for this reason that my best friend and husband and my baby sister and I got in a car this morning from Bronx County and traveled to Albany. It is for this reason that I now say to you, in memory of our First Lady at Albany Law School, Kate Stoneman, and in honor of our beloved professor, Mary Lynch, congratulations on a recognition so well deserved. Thank you for changing lives, and thank you for teaching us how to change lives. Mary, step up.
you and the many students that have come after you, there are other students that have come after you, <laughs> are the joy of my life. Um, they are what makes the day rewarding. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> in the journey of someone's life as they engage with the law, as they engage with justice, as they figure out who they can be and what they can do. It is incredibly exciting. I want to thank all of those people, many of them in the room, who took the time to join in this nomination. I know you are some of the most busy people I know to take one more time to do a letter with all that you serve and you do um, is incredible. I'm incredibly honored that you did so. Um, I want to also say that I am deeply honored to be recognized on the 20th anniversary of Kate Stoneman at the same event which honors such heroic women as came before me too many. Um, and also to join that prestigious circle of uh, women and Professor Moriarty, um, who have gone on before us um, in the Kate Stoneman legacy. I, as a teacher, I have to leave with one thought as I, as I keep going. Um, the poet, philosopher, and lawyer, John Donne, once wrote these lines in a meditation that was originally unpublished, but has been copied and well known. No man is an island, entire of itself, Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Well, I'm here to tell you no woman who seeks to advance equal opportunity for all regardless of gender or race or identity is an island unto herself either. Kate Stoneman's story was of collective action. It was of community. It was of suffragettes and people working together. The story of Kate Stoneman at Albany Law School is not a story of individual achievement or individual accomplishment. It started at Kathy Katz's, beloved Professor Katz's, 60th birthday dinner. And as Navi Palat talks about women gathering around a table to do amazing things in South Africa, we, in a less dramatic way, <laughs> gathered around a table to honor one of our own and celebrate her birthday and we were joined by many of the faculty I see still in this room today, Professor Moore, Professor Moore, um, Professor Shanks, and then there was this really young professor we were hoping to keep at Albany Law School, Donna Young. Um, we were joined by Professor Oda, and eventually on the committee by Professor uh, Dan Merrick Moriarty. My story also includes a story of co. I think I may have been the person who co directed, chaired, and delivered. I always have co next to my name. And so the secret is that with good partners, you can do amazing work. My first partner in Stoneman was Helen Adams Keen, and for eight years we co-chaired this committee together. She was an amazing collaborator. She leveraged the entire wider communion in this community and the state and beyond, and we had incredible fun doing that. Professor Nancy Moore was my co-director at the clinical program. Professor Brieger and I co-directed the domestic violence program. Um, and we have a new co-directors of the clinic today who've taken on the co-legacy. <laughs> um, we also have an incredibly collaborative clinical faculty. I first learned the importance and the joy of co-ing, of community, um, at my parents' meetings. My father, Patrick Lynch, and my mother, Bridget Agnes McCarrick Lynch, are the heart and soul of our extended family and of their neighborhood. And believe me, I was just down there this weekend. Everybody knows them, sending in free cheesecake. It was I, I couldn't walk down the block without hearing about them. I learned from my sister that the different life choices that women make should be celebrated and that there's no competition, whatever life choices you make around children or careers. I've learned from the feminists in my family, 
Patrick, Bridget, and Rudy that they sometimes are less sexist than I am, and they call me out on it. Um, and I've learned from my soulmate, Rudy Stegemeller, that men can put um, a woman's career first, a woman's career completely there for him to join when he believes in what she does. Um, you know, tonight is an incredible night for me because this is something that's given me so much joy for so many years, and this award touches sort of the tenderest part of my heart uh, because Kate Stoneman is just an incredible, uh, incredible legacy for all of us to be a part of. And so I want to leave you with one final thought. A colleague of mine, Professor Kristen Chung, uh, says something that some of the other speakers alluded to. We need to recognize that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, but we link arms with those who are on the journey with us. And we stand together in those linked, strong arms to allow those of you, my students and everyone's students and future people, stand up on our strong shoulders because we want to support and launch you forward. And Kate Stoneman believed in that, and her final words in her last interview, published just months before her death at age 84, was very philosophical about life. She said, time, place, and circumstances combine to help me accomplish my work. But she also concluded by encouraging young people, particularly young women, take your opportunities as they come. And so tonight, this is a room full of people supporting you young men and women. Go take those opportunities, but do it with the community and collaboration that you find modeled here before you tonight. Thank you very much. One last round of applause for our amazing 2014 Kate Stoneman recipient. <laughs> what accomplished and truly inspiring. Hard to follow. I just want to mention a couple of things from people who are not here with us today but who have made Kate Stoneman's legacy live on. One is Minnie Netter, class of 1972. She was a pioneer in her own right and worked to found Kate Stoneman Day, as well as the visiting chair in law of democracy and the Kate Stoneman Commencement Prize. She awards an annual scholarship to a student who embodies the spirit and tenacity of Kate Stoneman. Additionally, another dear, dear friend and former Stoneman chair, we honor the legacy of our beloved Professor Kathleen Katz. And in fact, Barry and I wrote an article that talks about her legacy, and we have copies for you thanks to the Albany Review. But Professor Katz, uh, we linked with Kate Stone, and there are so many parallels between their lives. She and her family have also graciously provided funds to the law school to start a lecture series in the spring. On behalf of the Kate Stoneman Committee, on behalf of all the new law schools, thank you for attending. Please join us now for a reception in the East Foyer. Thank you so much.